Hello everyone, I'm Jeff Stanley with Stanley Handcrafted and today is going to be a quick video on candle terminology. Now this is a question or these are a series of questions that come out and something that every new candle maker run in, runs into which is why I wanted to make a video about this one and cover some of the basics that you're gonna run into literally the first day that you get into looking into candles. And that's some of the acronyms and the vocabulary that's being thrown around or used with candle make. This one pops up quite a bit in the DIY Facebook group. People get in there, they start looking for candles, they start asking for uh, what wax, what wicks, everything like that. And then everybody will go through and start listing a bunch of different things and using terminology that can definitely sound foreign to somebody who's just jumping into this. Things like FO, EO, uh, hot throw, wick up, wick down, which is exactly why I wanted to make this video and go over some of these things. Now these are very basic terms and terms that you're gonna pick up uh, within the first couple days, first couple weeks of making candles. So we're just gonna jump right into this one and I'll go over so some of the most commonly used ones that confuse people right off the bat. So of course, jumping into waxes and everything like that, that's probably everybody's first question and people start throwing around numbers like 464, 4627, 6006, 4625. And a lot of these numbers mean absolutely nothing to somebody who doesn't know uh, waxes or anything like that. And basically those numbers are almost like product numbers for the wax. Like a soy wax is called soy or GB464. And that's just the type of wax it has. 6006 is a wax that I use. It's a soy and paraffin blend and it's, it's labeled IGI6006. It's basically just a product number. So whenever you see those numbers pop up, 4627, it's just referencing a certain type of wax. And of course, if you Google any one of these numbers, 4627, 6006, 464, it's gonna populate the first page of exactly what it is. The next one that a lot of people have issues with are EO and FO, and those are basically oils. So EO is essential oils. You'll see a lot of people just break it down, call it EO, and then move right on. Now, jumping over to FO is just fragrance oil. So it's EO and FO, and you'll see that one pop up quite a bit. So just fragrance oil. Uh, the next one going from there is gonna be CT or cold throw. Now, cold throw is the throw of the scent from a candle that's cold. It hasn't been lit, just you open it up, you smell it, that's the CT or the cold throw. Now, if this candle was lit, it would be throwing the scent hot. It would be, so that would be the HT or the hot throw. And then you jump into things like fragrance load. You'll hear a lot of people talk about fragrance load and what that is is the amount of oil that a wax can hold so 464 can hold up to 12 percent so when people say they used a 10 percent fragrance load that means for a pound of wax or 16 ounces they use 10 percent fragrance oil so 16 ounces of wax they used 1.6 or 10 percent for their fragrance load i uh, things like melt point and melt pool so melt point is the point at which the wax starts to melt and all waxes are different soy is right around 124 to 105 degrees so the, the, the melt point of soy 464 is 124 degrees. Now, of course you wanna melt that wax all the way up to 180 just to make sure it's fully melted, uh, kind of burn out any impurities or, uh, or moisture or anything like that that might be on the wax. But your initial melt point is gonna be the point at which the wax starts to melt first. Now the melt pool is when you have a candle that's burning and it's gonna be the amount of melted wax that's in the candle. Now, when you just start getting into candles, it can kind of go all over the place, but the rule of thumb is you want your melt pool to be right around one eighth of an inch to one quarter of an inch. Uh, a little bit bigger than that can be fine, but nothing over a half inch. If, you're, if your melt pool is a half inch big, you need to wick down, which is our next one. And wick down just means that you move down a size and wick. So if you had a, a wick like an HTP, which again is just a model or a brand of a type of wick, like an Eco or a CD. If you had an HTP 104 in this and you were getting a real big melt pool, like a half an inch, you would wick down. So you'd go from the HTP 104 to the HTP 93 so that you could get a correct melt pool. And of course, wick up is the same thing, just in the opposite direction. So if you had a melt pool that wasn't quite big enough, it wasn't going to the edge, you needed a little bit more or a bigger flame or a hotter flame, you would wick up. Meaning you would go from like an HTP 93 to an HTP 104. Now wet spots is another one that jumps in and I don't know if you can see it on that. Try to, yeah, you can kind of see it right there. You can see it looks like air pockets. 
Uh, and that's basically wax shrinks when it cools. Uh, it expands and it shrinks when it's hot and cold. So when you pour the wax in here, it, it funnels down, it goes in, it fills the entire jar. And then as the wax cools down, it starts to harden in certain areas and it pops away from the glass. Uh, this is a very normal thing. It's something that happens with almost every single wax. Uh, it's something a lot of beginners pay a lot of attention to just because they think it looks bad, but this is very normal and something that as you get going, uh, you eventually just move away from it and you don't think too much about them. And what you're looking for on that one is the glass adhesion. So it's as how much wax is adhering to the sides of the glass. So you're looking for glass adhesion uh, and then wet spots is what happens right there. Now mushrooming is another one and mushrooming is, if you can see the wick right there, you see how it looks really, almost like it bloomed up. It, it's, it's really big instead of being thin like it does when you start out. Now mushrooming is something that happens usually when you have a wick that's a little bit too big. Uh, some of the additives that you put in there, some of the coloring can, uh, can also affect that. And then of course fragrance load. If you sometimes have a little bit too much fragrance oil, it might drown out the wick a little bit, uh, create maybe a hotter flame, uh, or it basically can't extinguish itself. So it starts to mushroom like that. And it's kind of a carbon buildup at the top of the wick. Now to remove something like that, you can try wicking down. You can try lowering your oils a little bit, uh, removing some coloring or additives like Vibar or something like that. All those things can help contribute to that. Or it's something that can easily be fixed. Now I just mentioned Vibar, which is another candle term that not a lot of people use, but it's one that you'll definitely see come up. Uh, Vibar is an additive that you can put into candles that will help you get a little bit stronger hot throw or uh, it give you a little bit stronger scent so if you have a wax that doesn't throw throughout a big room like this you're not getting a big scent from it like you can only smell it like in a five foot radius around the candle a lot of people will add something like Vibar, which will help create a bigger scent throw. Now the pour temperature is exactly what it sounds like. It's gonna be the temperature at which when you're melting your wax, you're adding your oils, when you pour it from the melting pitcher into the candle, that's gonna be your pour temperature. Now a lot of people and most manufacturers with waxes and everything like that will recommend that you pour at hotter temperatures. It's not a bad idea. You can pour at any temperature, but you're gonna run into different things when you pour hot and when you pour cool. So for most waxes, Let's take 6006, you heat it up to 180 degrees, you add your oils anywhere in between 180 and 170, and then you stir it for a minute or so and pour. Now one of the reasons people pour cooler is uh, certain waxes shrink a lot more than other waxes. Uh, Soy 464 is supposed to be a non-shrinking wax, so when you pour it into the container, uh, you're not supposed to get much shrinking, which would create the wet spots and kind of pull away from the glass. But when you're using paraffins, that wax shrinks a lot more than certain waxes. So if you're using 6006, you pour it in there at a hot temperature, it's got basically a lot more time to really contract and pull away from the glass. So people will pour 6006 a little bit cooler letting that wax kind of shrink down a little bit before they put it in the containers. So you get less shrinking inside the glass. Now I will say one of the kind of cons to pouring cooler is once the wax gets into more of like a gel form or it gets a little bit hazy, it definitely leaves a little bit more wax inside of the pouring pitcher, uh, which of course can be a little bit more of a hassle to clean out. So it's kind of up to you whether you pour hot or you pour cool. I tend to pour hot just because it's easier to clean the pouring pitchers after. Now using a wax like 6006, when you pour hotter, like I said, that wax will shrink down a little bit more. And what it's gonna do is it's gonna create a sinkhole, which is another term that you're gonna see a lot. Um, and basically what that is, and I don't have a candle here to show it well, but when you pour the wax all the way on the candle, of course it's gonna cool around the outside of the candle first, is, which is gonna leave the middle part still soft and cooling last. And what happens is the wax around the outside shrinks and it starts to pull, and what it does is it pulls in the middle and creates a sinkhole. So it'll basically have a hole that goes right down through the center of the candle, which you then have to either fix one of two ways. You can use uh, a second pour method, which people will heat up another little batch of wax, pour it down through the center and kind of fill that hole. And then a lot of people will use a heat gun and that's what I typically use. You'll run a heat gun over the top of that, you'll melt the wax so it basically fills in the hole and makes it smooth again. Which brings me back to pour temperature and that's one of the things that you can help reduce also 
uh, with pouring coolers. So once you let that wax cool down a little bit, shrink down a little bit, you can pour it into the container and you get a little bit less of a sinkhole because that wax has had time to actually shrink a little bit more. Now, along the lines of sinkholes, there's something else called tunneling. And tunneling is basically when you light the candle, it's usually from a wick that's a little bit too small uh, or a burn that doesn't go completely to the edge the first time you, you burn a candle. And what happens is it starts to burn right down through the center of the candle, creating basically a hole or a tunnel that goes down through the center of the candle. Now, if you're testing candles and you get a wick that's too small, there's really nothing you can do. If that wick is gonna go right down through the center when you burn it, you have to wick up uh, or move to a bigger size. Now, if you have a candle that has the correct wick in it and you burn the candle, it doesn't go all the way to the edge. You didn't let it burn maybe the full three hours to get a full melt pool the first time. Maybe you did it for 45 minutes uh, and it created a little bit of a tunnel. You can fix that when the wick is the correct size. And basically what you would wanna do is run a heat gun over the top, melt that all the way back, make it smooth. And sometimes if it's down far enough, uh, you can actually dig the sides of the wax out, make that candle completely level again, and then light it again. And then of course, when you light it the second time, you'll let it get to the full melt pool so that it can burn from, so that it can create a melt pool and get basically a full melt pool or a good burn from edge to edge. Another term that comes up a little bit is power burn. This is something that you'll definitely do when you're testing candles and a power Power burn is basically taking a candle and letting it burn from start to finish or kind of uh kind of an abusive burn. Now, most candles, you wanna let them burn anywhere from three to four hours max, uh, just because they get really hot after that. Uh, you will get a little bit bigger flame. And then of course, after a couple hours, I mean, you've already got the scent filling the room. You really don't need to burn a candle for much longer than that. That scent will linger and stay in the room for quite some time. But it's a good idea to do uh, a test burn or a power burn, uh, and some people will call it an abusive burn. And that's basically to test your candle just to see what happens if you were to burn it accidentally for uh, 20 straight hours. And the reason this one is so important to test is you will have a customer that will take this candle home and they're gonna accidentally forget it somewhere and it's gonna burn through the entire thing. And if you've got a 30 or 40 hour candle, that's a long time to have a candle or a, a, an open flame burning around whatever they have it burning. So you definitely wanna take into consideration a power burn and how your candle looks when it goes through an abusive burn like that. Now, if you've made the candle properly with the right wick, the right wax, the right oils and everything like that, a power burn or an abusive burn that goes all the way through will still burn perfect all the way down. It's it's still gonna be extremely hot, so you definitely wanna be careful. But if you were to have a candle that had a wick that was too big, what's gonna happen is you're gonna get a really big melt pool. Uh, as that candle starts to burn down, it's also gonna heat up the glass a lot more, which of course is gonna make your wax melt a little bit more, a little bit quicker. And then of course, as that wax starts burning, your flame starts to get bigger also, and it actually, it actually creates a bigger flame and a hotter jar and a hotter candle. And then of course, it's gonna burn through that wax even quicker. And then of course, the flame is just gonna get bigger and bigger. And by the time you get down to the end of the glass, you're gonna have a candle that's definitely burning out of control on you. So in the beginning phases, you definitely wanna do a power burn or an abusive burn just to test your candles and really make sure that you have a solid product that you're gonna be putting out there. Uh, frosting is another one that comes up quite a bit. And basically what that is, uh, it typically happens with soy, 464, 444. Uh, but any soy wax uh, tends to get a little bit of frosting on the top of the candle. And that's basically, uh, it looks like a white dusted powder. If you go into any store, pick up a soy candle, you can see it on a lot of them. And it just looks like a, a, like a white dust over the top of the candle. Now it's something that's very normal and it happens a lot more with soy than it does for any other wax. Uh, you can reduce frosting or sometimes help it by pouring a little bit cooler. Uh, with soy, you can definitely pour it a lot cooler and not have the problems with uh, the sinkholes that you would with 6006. Soy is a non-shrinking wax, so you can definitely alter that a little bit. Uh, I've seen frosting happen with certain oils over others, so you can definitely alter your oil amount, how much your fragrance load, how much you're putting into the wax to see if you can reduce that a little bit. But it's also another one of those things kind of like wet spots where people just kind of get over it at some point. It just happens with soy. So obviously a beginner starting out doesn't know that. They think they messed the candle up and you definitely did not. It's definitely something more to do with the wax, the oils, the pouring temperatures. 
uh, and something that is just gonna happen with soy sometimes. So that's pretty much it. I think I got all the important ones or at least the ones that pop up the most. I know I probably missed a couple, so uh, I'll try to go through and add those in the video description down below. If you're watching the video and you're screaming one out, please let me know in the comments down below which one I missed and I'll try to go through and kind of answer those as well. And of course I have all the social media platforms I use down below. So if you wanna reach out, follow me, get in touch with me, uh, Facebook, Instagram, the website, uh, the DIY Facebook group and my email if you wanna reach out and definitely jump over and join the DIY Facebook group. Uh, it's a little over 30,000 people now, a lot of good help and a lot of good candle makers in there. And of course, if you liked the video, give it a thumbs up and thank you for watching.